a very quick announcement. Hi guys, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to make a little advertisement. So uh, my name is Irina, I'm from uh, uh, Master in High Performance Computing. So uh, outside I've written there, basically all the information you can find there. I just to be very brief, uh, so what we are, we teach uh, uh, scientific uh, programming so basically, we teach how to write the high quality professional codes for science, uh, the codes that can be run on uh, supercomputers uh, or on GPUs. We also uh, do have some uh, uh, machine learning in our program, though it's not the focus. Uh, well, uh, from next year, we try to introduce quantum computing also. Uh, you can see the whole list of our courses there. Uh, I, I would say we are really unique. Uh, program in the sense that uh, there are not that many places that teach you how to do a scientific programming. Uh, so we have scholarships for ICTP supported countries and the deadline is in like 10 days. So if you're interested, uh, just uh, don't be too, too slow. Uh, we also have uh, OJ scholarships uh, this year for people who are local or like richer people who can support themselves, but at least they don't have to pay the fee so they can get uh, their education for free if they uh, perform the project on a given topic. Uh, if you have any questions about this or you're interested, uh, please just find me during the break, uh, lunchtime, whatever, and I can ask, answer all your questions uh, individually. And I, I won't take any more time uh, uh, from the lecture. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice announcement and great opportunity, so take advantage of it. Um, so now we're gonna start um, um, our next session for today, introduction to uh, quantum error mitigation. Uh, we're gonna have two speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Daniel Mills. He's already online. He's one of our research scientists. And then we're gonna have um, uh, Silas Dykes, and he is uh, one of our software uh, engineers. Um, in any case, um, without uh, further ado, uh, Daniel, uh, it's all yours. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk, well, me, me and Silas are gonna talk a bit about quantum error mitigation. Uh, the first part, the first hour of this is gonna be a bit of a, some theoretical background into um, noise and error, and error mitigation, then Silas will take over for the second hour to talk a bit about Kermit, which is a software library we've developed to perform error mitigation. So error mitigation is sort of like a nearer term way to um, uh, prevent and manage errors in quantum devices. So later on, you'll also hear about some error correction from my colleagues, um, which is a bit of a longer term approach to dealing with errors in quantum computers. But for, sm for smaller devices, error mitigation is the approach people have taken up, taken to use. And I'll talk a bit about that now. Yeah. So there are a few ways that you might want to deal with noise in quantum devices. Um, so the first would be, the first thing you want to try is to reduce the noise in the um, components of the device as much as, much, as much as possible in the first instance. So this would include things like improving the um, like the, pulse, the quality of the pulse sequences that you um, make use of, for example. Um, you can also use, um, so this, this falls under uh, things like optimal, optimal control and compensating pulses. And you can try things, you might hear about things like dynamical decoupling, which is some pulse sequences you can add into your quantum computation to um, undo some errors that you might have inadvertently added. So these are very low level approaches to managing errors and managing them quite directly um, with the components of the device. You can try what I'm gonna call circuit level um, approaches. So these are approaches which will change the circuit that you're running, um, <coughs> uh, um, but, but not manage any of the results, for example. So things like noise aware compilation and routing. So this would be where you're picking the best qubits to use on the architecture, for example. Um, things like frame randomization, randomized compilation. So these are adding additional gates into your circuits in order to um, undo some rotations that you may have accidentally added or to randomize some of the errors to make them more favorable to you. So these are approaches where you take your, the circuit that you want to run and you change it directly. 
So this is a little higher, a little higher level. So you're not dealing with the components of the device itself, but you're now you're dealing with your the circuit that you're trying to run. Above that, I'm, there's what I would, I'll call application level approaches. <clears throat> so these are approaches where um, you you might change the circuit, but you also do some um, clever processing of the re measurement results you get from your circuit. Um, so combining them in some clever way. Um, or perhaps removing some that you know to be erroneous. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, so yeah, so we'll we'll spend a lot of time talking about the, this second approach. So this again is a little bit of a higher level technique to um, um, tackling errors, and then at the very highest level you have um, error correction, which you'll hear about later. So during this talk, I'm going to talk about these two central approaches, um, approaches that you can um, deal with by not knowing to, not dealing directly with the device and not abstracting away so much that you're doing error correction. Um, these are also often called things like digital error, error mitigation, where you're dealing with the, the circuit rather than the device itself. So I'll talk a bit about these, and these time techniques are the techniques we've targeted in, um, in our implementations in Kermit. So just to prepare you in advance um, and to prepare some of the terminology I'll use later in the talk, Kermit is this open source Python package that implements these digital error mitigation, some digital error mitigation techniques. Um, it has a com com compositional architecture based on uh, graph composition. So um, so I'll talk about this a bit more directly, but I'll also use this graph-based approach to describe some of the schemes that I'll introduce. Um, and what I mean but roughly by that, just to give some intuition at the beginning, is that um, you can imagine your error mitigation protocol described as a graph. The nodes in the graph are some sub-protocols that you're using and you might reuse and combine in different ways. And the edges of your graph just describe how the inputs and outputs from those subprocesses um, are moved between the processes. So this is the architecture we use within Kermit, and I'll use this notation to describe some schemes a bit later on. Uh, it's built on top of PyTicket, so if you're familiar with PyTicket, you're ready to go with Kermit, basically. Um, and you can quickly install it through pip. Um, uh, with usual commands and there's some documentation available at Kerm.it, so I've stolen the Italian domain name, which um, I hope doesn't offend anybody. And there's it's open source, and there's a manual available at the GitHub repository there. Um, okay, so that's kind of it. So let me just talk a bit about what I mean by noise and some of the terminology I'll use for different noise sources. So first of all, the, I'll distinguish between coherent and incoherent noises. So co coherent noises are noise, noises that can be represented by unitary operations. Um, so for example, you can imagine if you're wanting to implement some kind of gate um, in your circuit and your gate is poorly calibrated, you might want to rotate the block sphere by some angle, but actually you over rotate it or you under rotate it. And these types of errors are called coherent errors. <clears throat> and you also have uh, incoherent errors, which cannot be described as unitaries. And an uh, example of this would be like um, depolariz depolarization. So here, what the correct way to describe depolarization is to say that with some probability, uh, the state that you want to manip be manipulating is replaced just by the maximally mixed state. So you just lose a little bit of information um, under the effect of a depolarizing noise channel. So you can sort of imagine coherent errors as if your block sphere is rotating um, in a way that you wouldn't like. And depolarizing noises would be so something like your uh, block sphere uh, contracting. So you're losing some information to um, perhaps the environment. And just a final example I give here is a, a bit flip error. So in this case, um, you yeah, you're basically your zero states are being flipped to one, and one state is being flipped to zero. And you can sort of imagine this um, as your block sphere being contracted along one of the axes only. So information on uh, one of the axes is preserved, but along the other, um, you're losing some information. 
So these are a, a couple of uh, noise channels, some very common ones, and um, I'll use some of these terms later on as well. In practice, if you want to simulate noise, um, which you might be interested in doing, there are some tools to do so in Qiskit, for example. Um, there is um, the, the noise model, uh, there is uh, such a thing as a noise model provided through Qiskit, which you can use to describe um, some simple noise channels. For example, you can input just um, some depolarizing noise on single and two cubic gates, for example, or some readout or some bit flip errors on your readouts, on your measurement errors. And in practice, what these simulators do behind the scenes is add some um, kind of errors after each, after each gate. So quite a simple noise model, but these kind of tools are useful for doing some um, testing of your code or testing of the robustness of your circuits, for example. So I just bring this up in case you want to have a look that up a bit later. Okay, let me describe a simple, get, try, get, describe again a noise channel and a simple error mitigation technique. So I'm gonna talk about state preparation and measurement errors, or what you'll hear often referred to as spam errors. Um, and here the idea is that with, you've perf you perform your circuit and you perform a measurement and with some probability, the measurement causes uh, measurement outcome zero to flip to be one and flip and for measurement outcomes one to flip to be zero with some probability. So you have this, um, this simple uh, channel to the left here. You can describe this using a matrix N. So here we have like one, one minus E with probability one minus E, the zeros remain in the zero, zero, the zero states are measured as zero with probability um, are the one states are measured as zero with probability E, the zero states measured with one, and one minus R, the one, one states are measured as zero. So with, with this matrix describing your noise channel to hand, you can recover the ideal probability distribution just by inverting this matrix. So there's a simple technique uh, once you've characterized these values E and R to invert the noise and um, improve the quality of your measurement outcomes. So just to say that a tiny bit more formally, um, you have this uh, probability of measuring some outcome Z given that the true correct measurement outcome was Z, uh, Z dash here. Um, so this generalizes to uh, more than just one qubit. So in the, in the example I just gave, you had um, just a single qubit being measured, um, but this generalizes to uh, many qubits. So it, you have, in the end, very large matrices. Um, the size of the matrices grows exponentially with the number of qubits. And you can perform the error mitigation by inverting this matrix S uh, on the noisy probability distribution to recover the error mitigated probability distribution. So just to return to the graph notation that I mentioned before uh, to describe this error mitigation technique. Um, you start with some unitary you want to implement. The first step is to perform some tomography to establish this matrix S. So these first two boxes at the top, on the top right here, correspond to that procedure. Um, then you have two tasks to compile and execute the original circuit to gather the results from that circuit. And then the last step is to um, use the matrix that you've learned and the results from the device to invert the noise. So this is how we would describe it within Kermit's um, and uh, also a convenient way of explaining the protocol. So what we've talked about here is correcting errors in probability distributions. Um, so this is one situation that we would be concerned with. Um, in, in Kermit, we refer to these techniques as result mitigators or mit res. Um, but there is a, a, a second type um, call, which we call expectation mitigators or mit x's. And in this case, we're not concerned with mitigating the complete probability distribution, but instead with some statistics of the distribution. 
in particular, the expectation values of calculating some, um, the expectation values of some observable acting on the state produced by our circuits. So in such experiments, the inputs that you're concerned with are um, the, the circuit unitary and some observable that you want to calculate the expectation of. And indeed, so I have here the goal is the expectation value of this observable um, defined by this trace quantity here. So these types of experiments are quite common, for example, in quantum chemistry, which will be covered a bit later in the week. So as, a, as an example here, um, calculating the expectation value of this X observable corresponds to just uh, calculating the difference between the probabilities of measuring zero and one if you act this Hadamard state before the measurement. So you have to perform some rotation on the output state and me measure that. And you, from that, you can recover the expectation value of the, measuring the X observable. So in general, so I have this, so in, this gives a little example, but in, in general, the procedure can be described to the right here. So you um, have an input as an observable and unitary. You use your um, observable to calculate some measurement circuits. So in this case, the measurement circuit is simply just this acting of the Hadamard gate. Um, but in general, your operators might be much more complicated and you might have more complicated measurement circuits. Then you repeat the same kind of process as before. Um, you have a compilation step. Uh, you met, you um, accordingly execute the circuits and apply the measurement uh, circuits that you've built in the first step. And then at the, the, as the very final step, you recombine those measurement outcomes to calculate the expectation value of the observable that you began with. So you can see the, a bit of a difference here to the first type of error mitigation techniques. Instead now, instead of calculating probability distributions, we're just calculating some um, statistics of the output. So there are some different, there are other error mitigation techniques um, developed for this setting as well, which I'll discuss. Yeah, so this just says in words what I said before. Um, that's, that's these different steps of appending measurement circuits, combining the circuits, performing the measurement, and then recombining the measurement outcomes to calculate the particular observable you're concerned with. So this gives you, this procedure um, gives you a, an, uh, a, pro a noisy approximation for the observable expect the expectation value of the observable that you wanted. So you can sort of picture it as if um, uh, the expectation value is noisy and it's sort of like, as you can imagine, as, as if it's a distribution that's been shifted slightly. The goal of um, the goal is to derive a better approximation for the ideal. Um, and this is the target of performing error mitigation on these types of experiments. Typically what happens is you improve, improve the accuracy of the approximation, but you increase the variance in the approximation of these quantities. Um, so that's, this is the, a, a trade-off that you inevitably have. So you can have this kind of picture in mind of the distribution being spread out by performing error mitigation, but being drawn closer to the ideal. So just to outline some general steps for error mitigation of observable expectation values. Um, so typically the first step is to take the circuit that you want to run, perform some operation on the circuit, which I'm representing here by these U's. Um, this basically allows you to build up some data that characterizes the noise of the device in some way. Um, you, you're also, it's also taken that you're, you have at your disposable, disposable some relationship that, that the data has between itself. Um, so the combining the data in some clever way should be able to reduce the, the errors. So this this functional model step of an error mitigation scheme. And then finally, you use this data that you've generated in the first step and some knowledge you have about how this data should be related to itself um, 
in order to recover an error mitigate, error mitigated approximation for a observable expectation value. Um, so there are these these two step two um, kind of things that you need to learn during an error mitigation scheme, and then finally you can recombine them to produce a better approximation. Okay, so this is a, a general out, outline. Let me give a particular example of an error mitigation scheme. So first off, I'm going to talk about uh, what's called zero noise extrapolation. So the idea here is that, or at least the intuition is uh, on the bottom right here in this graph. So what you can what you can do is you can take your circuit and you can run run it on the device and you get some uh, value for this expectation expectation value. So what you can't do is reduce the noise, but you might be able to increase the noise. Um, so for example, if you increase the noise, run the circuit again, increase the noise, increase the noise, then you get you build up these green points, which which um, have this might for example have some decay. So as you're losing information to the to the noise, the expectation values will might decay towards zero, for example. Then what you can do is um, get some fitting function, fit to those decaying points, and extrapolate backwards to the zero noise value. Um, and this is roughly the intuition behind zero noise extrapolation. So there are a couple of things that you need in order for this to make sense. You uh, need an approach to increase the noise, and you need an approach to um, you need to agree on a function to fit to the decaying quant de decaying value of the expectations. So one approach that you might use to increasing the noise is to replace every gate in the circuit with itself, followed by its inverse, followed by itself. Uh, so the the kind of second two gates, the gate and its and its inverse, cancel out in the unitary that you're implementing. So the circuit that you're implementing is unchanged. Um, but the result is that you're in. If you replace every gate in this way, that you've increased the noise by a factor of three. Um, and you can repeat this process to increase it by a factor of five, any any odd integer. Um, and in this way, you so you you can increase the noise. Um, in a way that, in a controlled way. And there are other techniques to increasing the noise as well. Um, you might, if you have low, low level access to the pulses, for example, you can consider stretching the pulses um, or you can replace the gates in some other way. Um, but this is one example you can keep in mind. So th that's, the first, that's the first step, the first step um, to um, build up this data that you need to perform the error mitigation. The second step is to consider this functional model. So this is the um, function that you're fitting to the data. Uh, and there are, again, a few different, different functions that you might try and fit. Um, some common ones would be to fit some exponential decay to these values or some polynomial function. Um, they, each of these have their own justification for doing that. Um, and it'll depend a bit about on the device you're working with or the circuit you're working with as to which you might choose. And then the final step in this case would be just to, um, so you, you have your data, you have your function that relates the data, and now you can use that just to extrapolate back to the zero noise value. Um, so this is the zero noise extrapolation technique in our uh, abstraction that we described. <clears throat> so just to say that the function um, and, and noise scaling technique that you use will depend a bit on the device. So I have a couple of devices here. Um, this, uh, credit here to the team out of Mythic for performing these experiments. Uh, in this case, the ideal outcome was would be one. Um, and on the two different devices, you can see how, as the noise is scaled, the decay is uh, different. And indeed, the extrapolation technique, which corresponds to the, the color of the um, points at the zero noise scaling value, um, the accuracy of those scaling of those extrapolation techniques uh, depends on the device. So, for example, on the IBM London device, exponential extrapolation is closest to one, 
uh, on the Rigetti device. It's Richardson extrapolation, which is a, a form of polynomial, uh, a kind of polynomial that you would use for extrapolation. Um, so it's a bit un unpredictable, which is the best one. Um, but um, that's not something to keep in mind when you use these techniques. So what I said when I was describing zero noise extrapolation is that you can increase the noise, but you can't um, access this area in red here that corresponds to reducing the noise. So there is one case where you can reduce the noise, and this in particular is when you're considering Clifford circuits. So Clifford's, these um, Clifford circuits are a subset of all circuits that happen to be classically simulable. Um, and the approach of Clifford data regression, which is another error mitigation technique, is to make use of this fact. Um, in particular, the approach is to take the original circuit uh, as given and to look, look, into the, look into the circuit and for every gate in the circuit, which is not a Clifford gate, to replace that um, with uh, a random gate in the from, from the Clifford group. So the result is that your circuit, all the non-Clifford gates in your circuit have been replaced by Clifford gates. And as a result, you can classically simulate um, the circuit. You run those classically simulable circuits both on cl classical devices and on quantum devices, which allows you to build up a relationship between the um, noisy and exact values for those Clifford circuits, which are similar to the original circuits. And you can use that relationship to rela relate the noisy expectation value from the original circuit to what it, you can conjecture it would be um, in the exact case. Uh, so that's the intuition behind this Clifford data regression technique. So you can see sort of two, the techniques are kind of similar. So on the left here, I just do a little pictorial representation of Clifford data regression. You take the original circuit that you want to run, you replace the non-Clifford gates with Clifford gates so that it's classically simulable. Um, you can use the classically simulable Clifford gates, Clif Clifford circuits to calculate these green crosses at these uh, noise value of the device and at the noise level and at the zero noise level and build this um, relationship between the two pairs to use that to perform error mitigation. Or in the case of zero noise extrapolation, you can do increase the noise using these identity gates, so the unitaries and the inverses, and use that instead to extrapolate backwards. So these two techniques are sort of similar in that regard. More generally, the process I've described is to start with some unitary U uh, in red here at the top, do some transformation to generate new circuits, run those new circuits and the original circuit on the device, use that data to build up some relationship between the, um, the training circuits and the original circuits, and use this class, some classical post-processing in order to recover a non-noisy, a, non um, a noise-free value for the, or a air mitigated value for the expectation value. So again, so I can write this down in my favorites uh, graph notation. Um, so I, I'm, uh, yeah, just kind of the same thing I've described to you, and it develops. You build up some measure, some circuits that produce your expectation value, generate some modified circuits, execute those on the back end, do some classical post processing on those circuits, and use that in combination with the original circuits to generate an error mitigated value. So, okay, so now we have an idea about um, result mitigation and expectation value mitigation um, and a few examples of such schemes. Uh, the next thing you might try and do is to combine these schemes. And in some cases, this is a very sensible thing to do. Uh, in particular, a lot of the assumptions that we've, that go into developing these, there are a lot of assumptions that you have to make in, uh, when developing these error mitigation techniques. Uh, in particular, this relates to kind of, for example, the extrapolation function that you might use. This uh, uh, the extrapolation function you use um, 
depends on some the particular noise characteristics of your device. Um, and if those assumptions that you've made about the noise characteristics of the device were to be incorrect, then you uh, it might affect affect the quality of your out, the outcome of your experiment. But sometimes you can enforce um, these assumptions by using other error mitigation techniques, perhaps some of the lower level circuit error mitigation techniques that I described before. Um, so for example, uh, you can imagine using zero noise extrapolation and spam errors to correct the measurement outcomes. And that results in an improvement in uh, some improvement. And you can also use something like frame randomization which um, basically makes the noise in the device look uh, like a depolarizing depo noise channel, um, which is favorable to some of the extrapolation techniques uh, that zero noise extrapolation uses. So you can think a bit cleverly about the different ways to combine these techniques and when either of them um, result in better performance of the others. And these kind of combinations are at the core of the way um, are design philosophy for Kermit using this graph structure, because you can just swap in and out different nodes of the graph to combine error mitigation schemes. So this is often beneficial and something that we try to make straightforward with Kermit. <clears throat> um, so just a, a final example of um, an error, uh, combining error mitigation, an error mitigation scheme and how it's combined beneficially. So you might have come across these variational quantum circuits. So the idea of uh, here roughly would be um, to, uh, the idea in a variational quantum experiment is that you have some circuit with some uh, gates that are parameterized and you change the values of these parameters searching across this parameter space uh, until you find, for example, some minimum, which corresponds to some um, quantity of concern. So if you have, um, so if you have a, a noisy device, then the, the landscape that you're searching with these parameters um, becomes you know, not, not the ideal one, it becomes a bit, know, a bit bumpier or something like this. And, um, and what you want to be, what you might want to do is to smooth out this parameter landscape um, to mirror the the ideal one. And one technique that you might do this is to explore the entire the entire parameter landscape and then do some filtering to remove, say, the um, you know take some threshold to remove some uh, very low values, for example. So this is the effect of smoothing out some of the noise. So this is another error mitigation technique that you might be worried about. So this image, image here just gives, imagines that you have two, two parameters, two parameters you're searching over. You can build up this entire bumpy landscape and then remove the kind of bumps in the landscape. So the, the insight is that you can note that some of the points in this parameter landscape will correspond to Clifford circuits. So some of the angles will make the parameterized gates, Clifford gates, so that the whole, um, the whole circuit will be a Clifford circuit and you can simulate this classically. And there are several points in the parameter landscape where that will be true. So the way that you combine uh, Clifford data regression and this spectral filtering technique would be to calculate ideally um, all of the points in the landscape that cor correspond to Clifford circuits. Um, and so you can use that information to um, to uh, judge your um, so this basically gives you, gives you points in the landscape which you know perfectly um, so this improves again on top of the filtering technique um, improves the accuracy of the landscape that you're exploring So you can see just an example here being conducted on um, IBM Q's Sydney, where you've combined both threshold and Clifford data regression, um, which gives you something much closer to the exact classical simulation than the original noisy.
Okay, so how about the performance of these air mitigation schemes in practice? So just returning to my example of zero noise extrapolation, there are uh, a few things that might go wrong in practice when you're implementing um, air mitigation schemes. So the first thing is that, um, for, if for example, in this picture here, um, you might say pick the wrong extrapolation technique, like your extrapolation function doesn't match up with the one that is best suited for your device. Um, it might also be the case that the variance in the expectation values you're calculating for noisy values is quite large, so that it's very hard to fit the, fit an extrapolation function to, for example. Um, so these are a couple of things that might go, go wrong um, and result in you um, picking the incorrect extrapolated value. So I'm going to sh show some plots that were um, conducted, some experiments that were conducted to measure the performance of error mitigation techniques. Um, just to quickly prepare you for how they're going to look. So we're using what we call the um, relative error of mitigation, relative error of mitigation um, displayed at the top here, at the top, uh, this top formula here. So this quantity is the ratio of the error in the error mitigated value and the noisy value. So this means that if um, this quantity is uh, below one, then that means the error mitigation has been beneficial to use. If it's above one, then it's not beneficial. And we'll display these as these um, as these colors that I describe on the on the bottom here. Um, so, for example, so basically, the bluer the outer square, the better error mitigation has performed. The inner square shows the worst case of the experiments. Um, so, yeah, that would be higher than the average, and um, towards the red means that error mitigation is not really doing much. So these experiments in particular were conducted on noisy simulators, so not real devices. Along the x-axis here, I have the depth of the circuits. Um, and on the y-axis, I have the number of qubits that the circuit covers. The circuits that have been used in these experiments are so-called random circuits, which are used during quantum volume experiments, which you may come across. Basically, just um, gates applied very randomly uh, between random pairs of um, qubits in this in the circuit. So very, very random, no, nothing to do with any application in particular. So you can see that as the depth of the circuits increase, the error mitigation schemes perform worse. And as the number of qubits increase, the error mitigation performs worse as well. So recall that these blue, blue values are indicate that the error mitigation schemes are performing well, and the red ones indicate that there was no, no real point in performing error mitigation. So this is to be expected. So you can imagine that as the circuits grow in size, the noise really just takes over. So for the very largest circuits, uh, basically you're just getting noise, you're just getting random values from your circuits, uh, which means that the kind of data collection phase of the error mitigation experiment is, isn't really able to collect any information from the device. Um, it's just, it can't learn anything about the noise because it's just completely complete random. So for the very largest circuits, you expect that error mitigation schemes won't be able to do anything. And indeed, that's what you observe. Okay, so what about instead of using random circuits, if I use more application motivated circuits? Um, so here I'm using uh, basically um, circuits that are inspired by those used in quantum chemistry experiments, which you'll come across a bit later in the week. Um, and in this case, um, so I, sh I sh didn't mention, but the difference between the two left and right plots, the leftmost one uh, is using Clifford data regression and the one on the right is using zero noise extrapolation. So you'll see that um, when using random circuits, zero noise extrapolation performs very well on smaller circuits. And Clifford data regression performs well, but not as, not as well 
um, as zero noise extrapolation. So this time on the left, again, we have Clifford data regression. Um, and you can see that for smaller circuits, Clifford data regression is performing very well. And for, um, for large circuits, again, it's not performing as well. Uh, for zero noise extrapolation, we kind of have the opposite relationship now. Uh, in this case, it's not performing as well as Clifford data regression. And this is kind of to be expected because the chemistry circuits that inspire these circuits that are being used in these experiments contain a great number of Clifford circuits, Clifford gates. So this means that um, basically when you do Clifford data regression, the circuits that you generate during the data gathering phase of the experiment um, is very similar, uses circuits that are very similar to the um, original um, unmodified circuits. So you can expect that the data gathering phase to be quite productive in that case. The interesting feature that emerges is that now you can see on this rightmost plot, there's sort of like a valley of success that cuts down the uh, diagonal here. So for smaller circuits, zero noise extrapolation in the worst case is not doing terribly well. Um, and for larger circuits. So this might also be to be expected because for very small circuits, the devices themselves are probably performing pretty well um, since the circuits are quite small. So there's not much improvement to be gained from using error mitigation. Okay, so let's switch to these experiments which were conducted on the device. So again, on the left, I have Clifford, Clifford data regression. On the right, I have zero noise extrapolation. Um, and I'm using random circuits. So you see the same kind of phenomenon emerging that that's for random circuits, zero noise extrapolation performs pretty well on the devices. And Clifford data regression performs f fairly well, but not as well. Um, in both cases, it's not performing as well as it did on the classical simulations. Uh, and this is because for the, the noise models used for the classical simulations are, of course, much simpler than the noise models on the real devices um, and probably lower in, in amplitude. So on the real devices, you have much more complicated noise um, sources. And the assumptions that were that go into using the into making developing their mitigations techniques are not necessarily met by these real devices, whereas for the classical simulators, you're sure that they actually are. So you see that they, the, the real devices don't perform as well, but error mitigation still seems to help you out. Um, so I'll just, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the chemistry circuits run on the real devices. So I should have flashed this up a bit earlier, but the chemistry circuits sort of have this kind of uh, ladder structure where the you have C, CZ gates acting on two qubits in this kind of ladder structure with a small, uh, just a single qubit rotation at the bottom, followed by this increasing ladder of um, CZ gates. And this, this occurs for many layers. So running these uh, circuits on the real device, you see the same thing as you saw with the classical simulations, in particular, uh, roughly speaking, CDR, the Clipper data regression, does better than zero noise extrapolation. Uh, most of the time, error mitigation helps. In the worst case, it seems not to. And there are a few, quite a few squares here which are red where error mitigation was not shown to for result in any improvement. So you can see that on real devices, the performance of these schemes becomes a bit less predictable. Um, so this could be for many reasons. Um, the, yeah, that we don't understand the noise channels particularly well, um, that they change from, they change very, that the noise profiles change very quickly um, and lots of other things. So this is run on um, the IBM uh, Lagos device. Just to emphasize that it depends heavily on the device characteristics as well. These, these experiments were conducted on the IBM Casablanca device. And you can see that in this case, zero noise um, Clifford data regression really just performs, it com completely adds no benefits running Clifford data regression on these circuits. 
Um, so you can see, just to emphasize that it really depends on the device. Uh, it depends on the device. It depends on the circuits. Um, and yeah, it can depend on the device characteristics at any particular moment. So the, these results show that it's a bit hard to predict the performance fair mitigation schemes in practice, but there are some things you can take away from this. Um, for example, this plot in particular tells you that maybe for IBM Casablanca, um, which I think is not running any, anymore, but it, you should not worry about using any error mitigation. For chemistry type experiments, it's beneficial to use Clifford data regression. And for other, other types of experiments, it's probably beneficial to use zero noise extrapolation. So there are a few things that you can take away from these experiments. So that's just about all I have to um, say on, on this. Um, so just to prepare you um, for Silas's talk, um, there are several schemes currently implemented in Kermit that you might like to play around with. So zero noise extrapolation and Clipper data regression are there, for example. There's also probabilistic error cancellation, um, which I haven't mentioned, but this technique um, basically relies on the idea that you can um, modify your circuit in such a way that um, combining the results of the modified circuits has the effect of inverting the noise channel on the device after doing some characterization of the device. It has spam, which I've discussed, frame randomization, which I mentioned briefly, um, and it allows you to combine existing met methods quickly. It's built on top of Pi tickets, so you should be able to use it quite quickly. Um, and hopefully some of the techniques that are implemented there already can be easily reused and developed into new schemes if you wish to try that out due to this modular um, structure that we try to make use of. Um, and yeah, similarly, com combining error investigation schemes should be quite straightforward, I hope. So yeah, so we'll follow up with uh, next with some code examples for using Kermits and develop a bit more um, background on uh, mitigation through pra through a practical use practical use cases. So I hope you enjoy that, um, and I'll stop there and take any questions if there are any. Okay, um, let's have some questions from the audience. You're gonna need to have a microphone in order to communicate with our speaker. Dan, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. Questions? Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, could you just spend a few minutes explaining again the notation with the colored blocks? I'm, I'm just not familiar with that. If you could just explain again how that works. Uh, these ones here? Yes, thank you. Just what, what the inner and the outer color represents. Yeah, sure. So the, um, the, inner, the, the outermost color, so the largest square, indicates the average performance of the error mitigation scheme. Uh, and the innermost square indicates the worst case performance. So this was conducted over five uh, random circuits. Um, so yeah, so it's saying, for example, um, let's see, uh, let's pick maybe this bot the bottom left square on this leftmost plot here. You have a, a blue background, which means kind of on average, the error mitigation scheme results in an improvement. So anything that's um, sort of blue or green means the error mitigation scheme is performing well. And the innermost square is red, which means that in the worst case, the error mitigation scheme doesn't do anything. So there was a circuit um, run during these experiments where error mitigation performed as well as running the noisy experiments. Thank you, thanks. Okay, um, okay, more questions? I'm gonna get a workout now. Hello. Um, uh, is there a fundamental limit for error mitigation complexity? 
oh, how much error mitigation complexity, for example, um, do we need for different problems? Um, so, are you referring to um, the resource con resource consumption of the error mitigation schemes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they um, there are limits to the resource consumptions to maintain the same accuracy of the prediction of the expectation values grow exponentially. Um, but so these techniques will not work when circuits become really very large. Um, the, the, idea, the idea is roughly that these error mitigation schemes will carry us along until we have enough qubits to perform error correction, and then error correction will sort of take over. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. And other questions? Hi, um, I was just wondering why the expectation value decays um, when the noise is increased um, for the zero noise extrapolation technique. Yeah, so you can sort of imagine, um, like if you, if you keep adding noise, um, then you're sort of progressing towards just a circuit which just generates uh, uniformly random bit strings. Um, so in that case, the expectation value that you'll get um, from uniformly random bit strings is zero. So you can sort of imagine that as you progressively go towards generating just that like uniform distribution, so like get progressively closer towards zero. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? Hi, Dan. Um, thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering if you could comment on the like sampling overhead required for some of these uh, error mitigation schemes. Yeah. So, as I yeah, as I mentioned, you would um, typically require um, the sampling overhead to increase exponentially. For these experiments, um, we sort of in, the sampling is the number of samples you take is increased. Um, but the factor by which they're increased is constant. Um, just to demonstrate that in practice, you can sort of still get things out of it without um, um, going too hard on the number of shots you take. So I think in this case, the, there was a factor of maybe th uh, three or four. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. More questions? Hey, I have a question for you. So if I do an experiment, right, and I want to figure out if I should use error mitigation, uh, what would be the steps I should be doing in order to determine if it's going to help for me? Because obviously sometimes from your plots it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it doesn't seem like there's a, there's a feature I can kind of um, bite yeah. on for a given application. So what would you do? So in, I think in practice, the results from these experiments suggest that you probably need to kind of think very carefully. There's not too many broad strokes, things that I can say. Um, I can say that if you, if your circuit has a large number of Clifford gates, then you, Clifford data regression seems to re reliably result in an, imp an improvement. Um, um, otherwise, you can use zero noise reference. So this is like something you can take directly out of these experiments. Um, but in practice, you yeah, you really need to. You probably really need to sort of experiment a bit with smaller instances of, of your problem, um, with some schemes that you think might work, um, and run with that. So a lot of schemes will work quite reliably. Like spam error mitigation is quite will reliably work fairly consistently. So you can make use of that. Um, but you can try a bit with some of these more general techniques that are also techniques that are specialized to particular problems. For example, in chemistry, there are a lot of cases where you have some symmetries in your problem, which you can make use of um, to do some error mitigation. 
Um, so basically, there, there might be bespoke techniques which you should definitely use. There are techniques which re perform reliably generally, such as span. Um, there are techniques that work in general if you have lots of Clifford gates, and apart from that, you'll have to play around with some smaller instances, probably. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. We have one more question. Hi, um, sorry, I am a little bit lost, but uh, this application of the noiser, I mean, uh, it's at the beginning of the program, of the final for each cubic, I, I am a little bit lost, or after some uh, operation, sorry. The, uh, the, uh, the denoising? Yes. Yeah, so, the, so the, these were zero noise extrapolation and Clifford data regression. So in this case, the sort of, there were the steps that I described. So there's sort of like the data gathering step where you change the circuits and you run the altered circuits on the device. So this builds up some data. The correction is sort of like some classical post-processing on that data. Um, so the, the, the improvement in the result comes about because of the classical post-processing on the data that you've gathered. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yes, got one more over there. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if there is any problem when trying to combine uh, different uh, error mitigation techniques. Like, can we have a situation where, for example, one error mitigation technique can give the opposite effect when combined with when they have counter effect with each other, for example? Um, yeah, I'm sure that could arise. Um, there are definitely problems that you, um, they, for example, they might be tackling the same air noise source, in which case, um, it's sort of a bit redundant to combine error mitigation schemes. Um, so one example where the combination might be a benef uh, might not be beneficial. So there are some error mitigation techniques which rely on post selection. Um, so for example, um, they basically detect that some, for example, they might detect that some error has occurred in your circuit and then delete that, um, delete that particular shot from your results. Um, but so that in, in principle is good, but it has the effect of changing the description of the noise model. Um, so, and that the description of the noise model might be relied on by an error mitigation scheme that you use later. So by removing that noise source, um, you're sort of changing the assumptions that another scheme might make, for example. So there's, there is examples where combining them, you should think a bit carefully about, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I guess uh, if there are any more questions, uh, you can always put them in Slack and uh, Daniel will check Slack, right? If there are more questions, I great. So yeah. I didn't say that um, uh, Daniel Mills, he joined us from the Continuum office in the UK. Um, and uh, we'll have a 10 minute break now. It's uh, thank Daniel again for a very nice talk. And uh, 11.20, uh, we're going to uh, continue with part two. Okay? Thanks. <laughs>